attention to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to read for you the first 12 verses of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 as we commence the sermon. Here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 12, we read, And seeing the multitudes, He, our Lord Jesus, went out on a mountain, and when He was seated, His disciples came to Him. Then He opened His mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beloved brothers and sisters, I have read for you the beginning section of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. This long sermon, which is recorded for us in here, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew recorded for us this long sermon of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because of the name. The name for this sermon comes from the place where it was delivered. We are told in verse 1, He went up on a mountain. Sermon on the Mount. The word the Mount is a short form of the English word mountain. You could retract it. You could call it the Sermon on the Mountain. On the Mountain. The Lord preached this sermon when He was on this mountain. On the Mountain of God. You are told that the Lord Jesus delivered this long sermon on a mountain while sitting down. You, they are, you get this information here in verse 1 where you are told, And when He was seated, his disciples came to him. It is common, brothers and sisters, as you read the Bible carefully, to find our Lord Jesus teaching or preaching from a sitting position. And therefore, it is not wrong for a preacher, when he's tired, he's sickly, he's old, or for some suitable and reasonable reason for him to ask for a chair and he sit behind a pulpit or in front of a pulpit to preach. I say this because there is a very old pastor in his 80s or late 70s by the name of Edward Power in the Hope Church in Adelaide and he has become so old, so frail that whenever he was called upon to preach he would need a chair to sit on while he would address the people or preach the sermon from the pulpit on Sunday. He learned it from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to emphasize this point because it's important. It is not about the preacher standing up or sitting down. It is not about whether the preacher walk about in the front of the church as he delivers his sermons. This is not the point. Charles Spurgeon, when he was preaching in a metropolitan tabernacle in London, he was known to walk here and walk there like a charismatic preacher in our time. We do not call a man a charismatic preacher, a pastor, a charismatic church, because he walked about in the poop, you know, around the pulpit. No, 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 no. It's the message that makes a person, whether a person is a reformed pastor or a charismatic pastor. Look at what you are told there. If you turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, in another instance, look at uh, what we are told here of our Lord in chapter 13 of Matthew. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. 
and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore you realize here that it was common very common i give you another example there are many more but due to time constraint i call you to just one more in the gospel of john Lest you think that it is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. How about John chapter 8? As you are told there, in John chapter 8, the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 2. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Many of them will be standing around him. The Lord was sitting down. Now, in our time, in our generation, in our modern world, we look up and we like the person who is giving a speech to be higher than the audience. But in ancient time, it is not necessarily the case. So, we are learning something here, isn't it? The posture, the position of the person giving the lecture or giving a talk is, is, is different from our modern world. And so, let us not judge the ancient people or give excuse to say, oh, I cannot see the person, therefore I cannot concentrate. That's all nonsense. It's an attitude of the heart. In ancient times, the people sat down. Important people would sit and talk rather than stand and talk as we have it in our time. These are not important things. The important thing is what is the person talking about? Whether the person is lifting the glory of God, whether the person is preaching the truth, that is more our, our concentration rather than how the person is delivering the, the message. We learn three things from our Lord Jesus Christ. In this section, we are going to go into it in detail, but this morning I'm just simply giving you a general view of what we have just read. We find, brothers and sisters, that the Sermon on the Mount has one topic in mind, one focal point, one theme for these three chapters. He preached such a long sermon that, uh, that, that, contain, that is recorded in three chapters, but actually the Lord Jesus Christ had one thing in mind. And what was that one thing, the theme, the main theme? It is actually about the Kingdom of Heaven. If you look there in chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He begins by calling your attention to the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Go down to verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that then verse 20 now for i say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven and that is the theme brothers and sisters that is the theme again go to chapter 6 and verse 10 again he says in the prayer of our lord your kingdom whose kingdom the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Go down to chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Verse chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I hope by now, brothers and sisters, you get what I'm trying to emphasize here, to call your attention that when we look at this section of the Holy Bible, which is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about the Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven. And the emphasis is being placed everywhere. 
all the matters that he raised here has got to do with the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. When he talks about divorce, which he would eventually do as we go through this section of the Holy Bible, when he talks about stealing, when he talks about telling lies, when he talks about all the matters that he would raise in this long sermon, you realize that he was addressing people who are of this kingdom. And there is an application here, brothers and sisters. Are you people of this kingdom? If you are people who belong to this kingdom, you will live differently from people who are not of this kingdom. If you belong to this kingdom, you would want to protect the integrity, you will want to protect the safety, you will want to protect the good of this kingdom, isn't it? As a Singaporean, you get very annoyed if you travel overseas or even when you are in Singapore and you hear people speaking badly of Singapore, you get angry, especially when it is not true, isn't it? How much more the kingdom of God to you, isn't it? It is addressed as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, rather than the kingdom of this world for a reason. Because brothers and sisters, we forgot that. We have lived so well in this life, in this world, that we have forgotten of our citizenship in the kingdom of God. You realize that Matthew called your attention to the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God. It is synonymous actually. But in Matthew, the kingdom of God, the things of God is always referred to the things of heaven because Matthew was a, he a Hebrew, a Jew. The Jew loved God so much, the Jews would take the things of God very seriously. They will not just take it trivially, no. You, the, the Jews are very careful, especially with things that they want to talk about God. When they want to say the kingdom of God, oh, God is holy. And you thought of a replacement for the word God, the word Jehovah, they will think about, oh, let's address it as the kingdom of heaven. And so, whenever you find the kingdom of God being addressed in the Gospel of Matthew, it is always addressed as the kingdom of heaven. Except, in verse 33 of chapter 6, but seek first the kingdom of God. Only at pertinent, important points do you find the kingdom of God being mentioned. You see, brothers and sisters, this emphasis, this this at this call to focus on the kingdom of God was already mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ at the very start of his public ministry. If you go back to the Gospel of Matthew now and look at how it all started in chapter 4 and verse 17. When the Lord Jesus Christ started his public ministry, you may ask, what is the message of this preacher? What is he bringing to us? And if we are told that in chapter 4 and verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You realize that? The Lord, first sermon, is about the kingdom of heaven. When it comes to the longest sermon recorded in the Bible, it is about the kingdom of heaven. And it has always been about the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about how to enter this kingdom of heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, it is important for you to pause this morning. Because I don't know where you were from, month, from last Sunday to yesterday, Saturday. I don't know what kind of TV program you were immersing yourself in and what conversation you had with your family members, your friends, your colleagues and whatever may transpire last week. But I want you to remember this Sunday as you come to God on a Sunday morning, you realize that God has appointed one day in a week for you to be reminded of spiritual things. The things of this world can be so, so absorbing and so strong in pulling you to itself, to themselves or to itself. Brothers and sisters, often, often, often Christians forget the existence of the kingdom of heaven. 
They love the things of the world and they come to love them so much. They have forgotten that Jesus talked about the things of this world will come to an end, will rust, will, will decay and uh, will be stolen. But there is a greater kingdom that we await that will come soon. And when you come to Sunday, you come to church, then you are reminded once again of the existence of this kingdom. Because the Straits Times, the BBC, and whatever favorite radio channel you may be listening to regularly, they will not tell you the existence of this kingdom. Look at verse 23 of chapter 4. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. What do you know, brothers and sisters, having been Christians for many of you all these years of your life? Some of you grew up in Christian families. You have been hearing this about the kingdom of God all your life. But what do you know? What do you remember about this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven? More importantly, brothers and sisters, now that you are reminded once again of the existence of this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God, do you, do you, do you seek this kingdom of God? Do you? Or you are seeking the things of this world more than the kingdom of God? I must. I must go to Disneyland. I must make sure that I go at least once to Disneyland this lifetime. But what about this fact, brothers and sisters? I must, I must make sure that I enter this kingdom of God, that this kingdom of God is mine. This kingdom of God is where I will spend my eternal life. It's important, brothers and sisters, for you to know about this kingdom. Look at what the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, brothers and sisters, if you turn back with me to the passage here in chapter 5 of Matthew. Look at what you are told there in verse 1, very carefully about the, the context of this sermon. It says, And seeing the multitudes, there was a crowd, a lot of people. He went up on a mountain. He went out. He separated himself from this crowd. And as he went away, he was seated. His disciples, the twelve disciples, came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. He realized that the sermon was preached to his disciples and not to the multitude. You realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, before he preached this sermon, he separated himself from the multitude. This sermon is an important sermon, and only those who are of his kingdom should listen with care. Not just that. His disciples must know about this kingdom and the content of this kingdom and the people who live in this kingdom and how to get into this kingdom. They must know well so that they can bring this same message about this kingdom to the multitude outside. And what are you told here, brothers and sisters? The Lord Jesus Christ begins His sermon to his disciples by describing for them the character of the citizens of this kingdom. When we think about the people in Thailand, you say, ah, the Thai people, they are really the land of the thousand smiles. It used to be that way. Thai people were known to be very gentle and very, very courteous and like to smile, especially when you are a foreigner. I th I'm told that this is increasingly no longer the case, but it used to be the, the perception that people have about Thailand. People, when they think about the Japanese, they have some similar kind of cultural traits that they, they would like to describe about the Japanese people. The, the Korean, uh, the, the, the Chinese people from China, we always say, Ayo, China people, they talk very loudly. They don't care who's around there in the MRT or in the lift. When they answer the phone, Wah! Volume number 10, they talk very loudly. That's, a, that, that, that's what people think about generally, generally, about people from a certain country, a certain culture. When you think about people, the Indians, 
what do you think? Well, you will see, remember that the Indians, they like to, not that they have to, but it is their cultural practice there. They like to eat with their hands. And so they eat and take their rice, dip in the curry or whatever, and then they eat this way. My, my grandmother used to eat with all her hands too, because, you know, she's of that culture. She likes to eat with, with, with all these things as well. What about the character? What about the description of the kingdom of this kingdom of God? It's important for you to know. We are going to look at it very very soon in the coming Sunday. But more generally as an introduction, let me remind you of this, brothers and sisters. You claim to be members of this kingdom. You claim to be citizens of this kingdom. What kind of rules do you uphold? What kind of characteristics should you <coughs> ensure that you have learned to exhibit in your life? It cannot be that you belong to this kingdom and you never resemble anything about the people of this kingdom, isn't it? When people look at you and say, Ah, you belong to this kingdom? Cannot be! You don't speak like the people of this kingdom. You don't use the vocabulary of the people of this kingdom. You are unlike anybody in this kingdom. You find eight qualities. The Lord Jesus Christ summarize about the character of these citizens. Not that there are only eight points, but these are the eight qualities as representation of the people of this kingdom. If you belong to this kingdom of heaven, you should highly prize at least these eight qualities that God looks for in a person who belongs to this kingdom. We are told the eight qualities here with the word blessed. 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 And why? Why did the Lord give these eight qualities? Well, He actually tells us the reason why He wants all His disciples to uphold and to find, to make these eight qualities real in their lives. You know why? Because He tells us so in verses 13 to 16. He's calling His disciples to be different from the world. You are the sword of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. And it gives light to all who are in a house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. In heaven, the Lord is actually telling his disciples this. No salt, you know salt, salt. When you put salt in, it is because it's salty. When you when you put salt into your tongue on your tongue, what happened? Your tongue can taste saltiness. But what happened if somebody give you a a, a, a tablespoon of uh, things that look like salt, you put it into your mouth and mm, mm, you try, mm, there's nothing salty. It looks like salt. It doesn't taste like salt. What does it tell you? It's not salt. It's, a, it's, it's, it's something else that looks like salt, but it's not salt. There are a lot of people who look like Christian. Hey, hey, that girl uh, look like Christian. But the moment the girl opened her mouth, ayo, vulgar language, ayo, all the things. And people say, ha! Ah! I don't think this person is a Christian because I know Christians, they don't talk like that. You understand what I mean now? It is the same with a light, a, 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 a candle. People light candle when it is dark at night in order to give light. What is the point of you lighting a candle and a candle never light? What's the point of a candle? You might as well throw away the candle. It is of no use. When I was growing up in the kampung, every now and then, Singapore in those days, People nowadays are not grateful for what the government has done. But I'm telling you, I live when the governments just became the government of, of Singapore and they were actively trying to make Singapore what it is today. I tell you, there were a lot of blackouts, you know. Suddenly, you are eating halfway and boom! The whole kampong become dark, you know. Especially if it is a, 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 a night without stars or the moon is not on, in the sky. I can tell you it's really picked up. You cannot even see the person in front of you. And you, your chopstick and your, 
your your dinner, you cannot continue. You don't even know where the dishes are. You have to put it down. You have to find your way around. Go to the drawer, open the drawer, and oh, candle, and then uh, look for the match box, and then match it, and then the light comes on. Then everybody, you can, you can literally, I can, I can still re imagine my grandmother, my father, my brother and sister. They all say, ah. at last we can see it. You are meant to be that light. People are lost. They're finding their way. I want to divorce. I want to divorce. I don't care. I want to divorce. I don't care. I want to steal. I want to commit adultery. I want to visit prostitute. I want to sleep with this man. And, uh, and then you are, are the light and say, No. It is a sin. Immediately, because of what you say from the Word of God, people otherwise will not hear but you brought the word of God to them suddenly they realize in their conscience ah, I better not do it it's wrong I'm not a Christian yet but my conscience tell me it's wrong you understand what I mean that's what you are meant to be and that's why God described you Christ described you with these eight qualities of blessedness the Lord is actually showing the contrast between the people that belongs to this kingdom of God and the common people you find around in the world. They don't know these eight things. They don't know these eight blessedness, the Beatitudes. They are lost. They don't even know what is good for them. They don't even know what is right and wrong. They constantly go against their own conscience because nobody pitied them. Nobody was loving enough to tell them, hey, it's wrong. And with all love and sincerity, tell them and show them why it is wrong. Look at what we are told here, brothers and sisters, about the people of this kingdom. Look at how you are to deal with your anger. If you turn there to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to verse 26. A lot of us, we say we have a hot temper. We are angry people. If you are of that sort, and there are many people in the world who are of that sort, they belong to God's kingdom, but they have this problem. And how should they deal with this problem? That's where Jesus tells you, do something about it. He tells you, Jesus is actually very practical, you know. He tells you, you cannot be like that. If you are, this is how you should solve your problem. Again, there are people who are weak in sexual matters. Jesus tells you that in chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. Now that divorce and remarriage has become a common place around the world, Jesus wants you to know what the teaching of the Bible is in chapter 5, 31 to 32. And also the next subject is indeed a problem in our world today. People actually, especially people who are politicians, frequently they take a vow, they make an oath to say the truth and nothing but the truth, but they don't believe anything they themselves say. They tell lies. Jesus says, as a Christian, as a member of the kingdom of God, chapter 5, 33 to 37, this is how you must uphold truth when you take an oath out of vow. How about those of you who watch Chinese shows that often it's all about taking revenge. You kill my father, you kill my mother, I kill your father, I kill your mother, and on top of that, as an extra, I kill your grandfather and grandmother also. Those sword fighting show is always about family honor and revenge. Well, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 38 to 42, how a Christian should deal with and how a Christian should handle all these matters. I want to take a pause here and help you summarize uh, and keep stock of what we have just heard. Jesus is very practical. The Christian religion is actually very practical. The Christian religion does not have a checklist that says you must do this thing and then do that thing and then do this thing and then do that. No, 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 no. It is about life. It is about life. If every Christian 
is to live like that, brothers and sisters, don't you think you will turn the world upside down? You know how? Because the world has its own system. The world has its own values. And here come Christian who is totally opposed to all this and then we become the majority. We turn the world upside down. Now the world is turning us upside down. Right? The world is living in opposition against the will of God. The world is trying to change us. The world in two weeks time is going to have ping dock party at the Hong Lim Square. What are we supposed to do? How are we to react? Oh, brothers and sisters, we cannot compromise, we cannot go along. But we will turn the world upside down if we leave out what Jesus is teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus Christ does not agree with the popular teaching of the world. The people have changed what God says into what they like. For example, look at what you are told there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. And here I want to read for you because it's very relevant to our time. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he make his sun shine, sun rise on the evil and on the good, and send rain on the just and on the unjust. But if you love those who love you, and what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What do you learn here, brothers and sisters? Isn't it to be different from the world? The world say, Pao Cho! My sha Pao Cho means take revenge. The world say, if you slap me on one side, I'm going to slap you back on the other side, isn't it? The world say that if you steal my thing, I'm going to steal your thing, isn't it? The world say, if you scold me, you embarrass me, I'm going to scold you and embarrass you back, isn't it? Christians are looked upon as weak la. You get bullied around, pushed around because you are weak la. Isn't it? To follow Christ like that and to take Jesus' teaching seriously, ayo, we will appear to be weak and we will be taken advantage of, isn't it? You have to decide, brothers and sisters, will you have Christ or will you have the world? Because the world has changed what God says. And the world is imposing upon you what the world wants. And many Christians have already fallen. You find Christ calling you to treat one another differently from how the world is treating each other. Look at what you are told there in Matthew 7 verse 1 to verse 5. You are not to be judgmental of one another. Judge not. You are not to be judgmental of one another. To be very honest, in recent years, I've come to realize that actually, we always judge people wrongly because we don't know. We don't even bother to find out the true story. Sometimes people react differently. Sometimes people are the way they are. And we give them worst definition, the worst interpretation of their action without realizing what the person is actually going through. And therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, let us stop being judgmental of one another. Let us exercise goodwill to one another. If you know the person well enough and it is out of character for the person to say things like that or report it to you, People say, oh, that person say like that, look like that. But from what you know the person to be, it will be our character. Most likely it is. You understand what I mean? We are Christians first. And so let us give people a second chance in whatever guessing we may be involved in. 
Then again, we come to the golden rule of relationship, which is found in chapter 7 and verse 12. The golden rule of relationship. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. How you want to be treated, you treat people. It is very sad. As I give you the classical, the classic example of people. Yeah. About this matter of relationship. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. And there was this in the old church, this lady who always said, that, Oh, she's scared of seeing a coffin and seeing dead people and dead bodies. She never attended anybody's funeral. Never attended anybody's father, mother, brother, sister or relative's funeral. And yet when her own brother died, she was so angry with the church because so few people came to her brother's funeral and people have to tell her, Hello! Hello! Whose funeral have you attended? Double standard, right? You don't do for people and you expect people to do for you. In the name of love, in the name of God, wow, you become so spiritual. But when it was other people's time, where were you? You are very demanding, you know. You are a great hypocrite, isn't it? And therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you also do to them. I have merely, very quickly, give you an overview as to what the Lord Jesus Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount. I just wonder, even at this point, any of you have already come to be pricked in your conscience about certain matters that I have raised. Do you behave like the citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Do you? It's important. Do you? Will you do your, by the grace of God, your effort? To discipline yourself to make sure that what is true about the citizens of heaven will also likewise be true in your own lives. We come to the last point, and the point is this, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ preached this Sermon on the Mount because He wants people to enter this kingdom of heaven. Look at what you are told there, if you turn with me to chapter 7, Verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Do not be surprised that the world hates you. Do not be surprised that Jesus is asking you to live so differently from the world. Do not be surprised that the world look at you and say that you are out of fashion. Look, many will go to the road that leads to destruction. Few would find themselves on the road that leads to life. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants you to be on the right road. If you turn back to what we started off in Matthew chapter 5, and I want you to look carefully at what you are told there in verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs belongs the kingdom of of heaven. Then you go down to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking about people who belong to this kingdom. And we are told here very clearly that it is so. And therefore, what is said from verse 3 to verse 8 and the rest of the sermon ought to be of concern to us because it's about entering this kingdom it is about being part of this kingdom it is about showing evidence in our lives from our life that yes 
I belong to this kingdom. When you are overseas, when you open your mouth, immediately people know that you are from Singapore. How? Because you speak whether you like it or not. When you are off guard, you will speak Singlish. No la, who say la, Singapore cheaper la. People know you are from Singapore. Am I right? Therefore, when you are off guard, when you automatically react to situation in your life, people will know whether you belong to this kingdom or not. And that is so. And I hope you'll be more conscious now of your own <coughs> The entrance into God's kingdom will be narrow and difficult. Many will not enter it. Along the way, you will even find false teachers who would lead people astray. They will be deceived. They will deceive people. And people will walk on the way that leads to destruction. It is important, therefore, brothers and sisters, for us, Consider this Sermon on the Mount and take it to all that the Lord Jesus is talking about. You realize the last series of sermons I preached to you was on heaven. Another name for heaven is paradise. Another name for paradise is a sermon, is a sermon on the Garden of Eden. And I tried my best to show to you, brothers and sisters, that our future is heaven. Our future is to be in a new earth. I hope you remember all the sermons. And now I'm entering into this, that those who will ultimately be in the kingdom of heaven on the new earth, these are the type of people who will be found there. God said that in the new earth, there will be no criminals, there will be no sinners, there will be no devils, there will be no hypocrites. And there will be no tears, there will be no pain, there will be no suffering. If you have time, you read this Sermon on the Mount, you'll realize that if everybody who is living there behave like this, uh, it's going to be a wonderful place to live in. Everybody is compassionate, is merciful, is kind, is loving. There is no insincerity, there is no judgmental spirit. Everybody will do for others what they would like others to do for them. Everybody will love God and do everything for the glory of God. There will be no need to, for stealing because people will be most willing to share. There is no need to tell lies because God is in the presence of them all and all truth will be known. What a wonderful place heaven is. And what wonderful people will be found there. And I hope, brothers and sisters, that you will indeed exhume this, this fragrance of heaven as you live in your life on earth at the moment. Let us pray.